The Daleks' master plan is the 12-part Dalek epic first broadcast back in the winter of 65. Despite being mostly missing, only episodes 2, 5 and 10 exist, it is still available for all to enjoy as a reconstruction using off-air soundtrack recordings and pictures taken on set and off-air, the best of which is made by Loose Cannon, and this is how I chose to view it this time on a custom DVD I created. The story itself is an odd one. It's the longest Doctor Who story of all time. I know Trial of Time Lord is technically 14 parts, but really it's four distinct stories. It's also the first to have a Christmas special, the first to bring back a character they'd met before, and the only story to have a prologue story to come a whole serial before it in the form of Mission to the Unknown. So without further ado, let's review every episode of this monster of a story and give each one a ranking since different parts of the story are so unique, it's worth going very in depth on each individual part. Prologue, Mission to the Unknown. So this is the only ever story not to involve the Doctor, and has space security agent Mark Corey investigate a possible Dalek presence on the planet Kemble, using a ship captained by Garvey with his crewmate Lowry. This episode is in a word, tense. There's a desperate struggle to fix the ship, and then when that fails to send a warning message about the Daleks' plans to the solar system, while being enclosed by Varga plants and then later, Daleks. It's paced very well, especially considering it only has a measly 24 minutes to play with, which plays to the strengths of the creepiness of the Varga plants. If you're pricked by a Varga plant, you have the urge to kill as well as becoming one eventually. This leads to a bit of animosity between Corey and Garvey when Corey has to shoot Larry as he's been pricked. Corey and Garvey are played brilliantly by actors Edward D'Souza and Barry Jackson, and really help carry this episode from start to finish, and overall it's a blast, with just about every element working well, and it has a deliciously grim ending. Ranking 9 out of 10. Episode 1. The Nightmare Begins. Five weeks after the transmission of Mission to the Unknown, episode 1 of the Daleks' Master Plan is broadcast to extreme hype having held the audience in suspense. It truly is a great one too, the tension is already rising as the Doctor learns more and more about what the Daleks are doing and who's involved very early on. Katrina is actually a very fun companion and I enjoyed her short-lived time in the TARDIS. It's interesting to have a companion that considers the Doctor quite literally a god as she's from ancient Troy. Unfortunately, Stephen is unconscious for most of the episode, but we also meet Brett Vian as played by Nicholas Courtney, and that must be one of my favourite side characters of all time. He's respectful, respected, and is desperate to do the right thing. I love how he's the only one who is not hostile on Kemble, yet the Doctor traps him in his magnetic chair, adding a bit of irony. Things are still have yet to get going, however this episode is mainly putting things into place, and it works very well. Ranking 9 out of 10. Episode 2, Day of Armageddon. This is without a doubt the second best individual episode from this story. What a miracle it happens to be one of the ones that's been recovered. The acting is superb, the characters are amazing, and the music is brilliant. The sheer tension literally kills me by the end of episode 2 with an amazing cliffhanger. Despite seeing him a bit in the previous episode, we get our first real taste of Mavic Chen here. He's cunning, manipulative, and power mad, which plays to every strength Kevin Stoney has as an actor, and he remains my favourite guest star of all time due to his performance both here and as Tobias Vaughn later in The Invasion. The conversation between him and the Master of Zephon is extremely entertaining. The two have great chemistry and it's fun to watch them try to outplay each other as men of power. It also contributes greatly to the world building of the universe we've been plopped into for this serial. Nation clearly knows what he's doing. In the end, I can't praise this episode enough. It's enthralling and exciting from start to finish and I absolutely love it. Ranking 10 out of 10. Episode 3. Devil's Planet. This episode manages to carry along the pace and tension from the previous episode, while slowing down a bit to give us a slight breather before building up again towards the end of the episode for a very climactic cliffhanger, just about doing exactly what it needs to do. The subplot of the convicts on the planet Desperus, a penal colony, trying to board the spa which the crew had used to escape Kemble in the previous episode adds to this story amply, and it's interesting to see how backward the society on Desperus becomes when the convicts are left alone to their own devices. However, I do feel that it's a bit lacking as the convicts are dealt with way too easily and don't get enough screen time to flesh out as characters. Other than that, everything is done very well, but not quite as well as the previous episode. Ranking 9 out of 10. Episode 4 The Traitors. A very close better to Day of Armageddon, The Traitors is absolutely brilliant. 
possibly the darkest episode of the 60s too, as we have both the tragic death of Katerina, who sacrifices herself even though she didn't fully understand what was going on, and the death of Brett, which always makes me feel really sad as he was a great character, and to make things worse he was killed by his sister who was deceived into thinking he was a traitor. The scene with Daxter is a great one too. He's been Brett's friend for years, but even he has betrayed them, and then when Brett guns him down, it's a really powerful moment with the outrage at Hartnell's doctor shows, and Hartnell is putting in one of his greatest performances during this story, and in that scene it's really exemplified. At the beginning of episode 5, when he realises just the Doctor and Stephen left, it reminds you of how much they've lost to try and warn Earth, and it really gives the show an unprecedented sense of danger. The show feels far too safe these days, but at this point in the story you feel anything could happen to any of these lovable characters who are mercilessly gunned down by the Daleks or caught in Mavic Chen's web of lies. Overall, this is definitely the greatest episode of the lot, and it's a tragedy that it no longer exists in the original form, as I'd say in terms of individual episodes of Doctor Who, this may be the greatest. Ranking, 10 out of 10. Episode 5, Counterplot. Their only friends in this hostile universe having been slaughtered, the Doctor and Steven have been left by themselves and transported with Sarah Kingdom, the space security agent who killed Brett, and stranded on the dangerous planet of Myra due to an accident with an experiment in molecular dissemination. This episode is really good. It continues the feeling of isolation the traitors built up, and is amplified by the rich atmosphere of Myra, haunted by invisible creatures, which are actually pretty scary, as unlike other invisible creatures in Doctor Who, you never see what they look like, which keeps the mystery. They sound very tall, and they act malevolent. The unknown evil is always something which is very frightening. Sarah, while introduced in the previous episode, gets some proper screen time here, and it's done really well. Jean Marsh is a brilliant actor, one of Doctor Who's best, and plays the character with ease. Nation writes her character beautifully. Her having come to terms with killing her brother under false pretenses is quite dark, and is in the end what changes her as a character. One character in this episode who really doesn't get the limelight anywhere else in the story is Carlton. Head of the base security service and Chen's right hand man, he's every bit as cunning as Chen, but not as ambitious. You can tell through Maurice Browning's amazing performance that he knows Chen is mad, and is willing to use that as a foothold for himself and to keep his position in the event of a Dalek victory. It's a shame the character is criminally underused in the rest of the story. My only fault here would be that the pace is killed off a bit and the tension feels slightly diminished, but it's still amazing, and the end of the first five episode run, which if it was by itself, would be one of my favourite stories. Unfortunately, it goes a bit downhill after this. Ranking, 9 out of 10. Episode 6, Coronas of the Sun. This is the first episode of the story to be written by Dennis Spooner, as Terry Nation was not available to write the whole story, and it's pretty clear throughout that they both write in a different style, and on a different level, but I'll get to that properly with episode 8, as Spooner does do a decent job in this episode. The tension and pace is killed off a fair bit, apart from their escape from Myra, which is actually pretty good, but it does seem like a turbulent handover of writers. The dialogue as well certainly isn't as good as it was in The Nation, and the whole script doesn't feel quite as tight. However, it's still got some great things going for it. The episode does what it needs to do, and mostly props up the atmosphere in a diminished state, but as I said, the escape from Myra is brilliant, and Chen, as usual, is stealing the show when the crew are forcefully returned to Kemble. I specifically love the line that when Chen addresses Sarah, she just says traitor in reply. Overall, this episode is good, but you can definitely notice a slight drop off in quality from the previous fantastic episodes. Ranking, 8 out of 10. Episode 7, The Feast of Stephen. Um, <laughs> what? So this was the final episode written by Terry Nation, and for better or for worse, you'll be questioning everything by the end of this episode. So it's the first Christmas episode, and since the story is so long, and it was broadcast on Christmas Day, they decided to relieve us of some of the tension, for a week, which I think was a good move, and it worked within the context of the broadcast, so unlike later episodes, I'm not going to complain about it as much as being out of place in the story. Basically, the entire plot is, they land in Liverpool on Christmas Day and have one of the most minor run-ins with the police I've ever seen on television, before gallivanting off to Hollywood where they cause a lot of confusion and shouting for the rest of the episode. Yeah, a lot of shouting especially. This episode is utterly bonkers, but it has a certain mad charm to it, and it's something I'd want to watch on Christmas Day, more so than some of the new Who specials at least. Overall, 
get your badness here. After all, Hartnell does one of the first TV fourth wall breaks unscripted, wishing us a happy Christmas. Ranking, 7 out of 10. Episode 8, Volcano. Okay, Mr. Spooner, I get it. You're a very different writer with a different style to Terry Nation. He's dark sci-fi, your sci-fi comedy or historical comedy, and you're still one of my favourite Doctor Who writers. But why do you have to write an episode so poorly paced, out of place and wrongly toned as this compared to the rest of the story? The Feast of Stephen had reason for being out of place, but this is just unacceptable. Basically, most of the episode is the crew ambling about and they meet the monk who sets the most easily resolved trap after one really strange scene between them. While ever so painfully slowly back on Kemble, they begin to realise that the terranium the Doctor gave them was a fake. It's not awful, it just doesn't feel connected to the story at all. And you could sum up episodes 7, 8 and 9 in about 10 minutes. The Daleks discover the terranium is fake and the monk is back for revenge. That's it. For what it's worth, by itself, it's still enjoyable enough, but it just shouldn't be here. 5 out of 10. Episode 9. Golden Death. There's not really much to say here. Things finally get moving again, fortunately, and it's starting to feel a little bit like the Daleks' master plan again. However, it's really poorly paced, and I'm just not really feeling any tension which defined the first five episodes of the story. It's an enjoyable little romp through ancient Egypt for what's worth, however this continues into the next episode which is much more enjoyable. It's just very slow and shows along with the previous episode that Spooner doesn't have many ideas and it's just biding his time until we reach the climax of the story. Ranking 7 out of 10. Episode 10, Escape Switch. Things really get going again here. The Daleks and Chen are on form again, especially with their interactions with the meddling monk, as played by the illustrious Peter Butterworth. It's a lot of fun to watch, and to be honest, he's better here than he was in the previous two episodes where he was the focus. The monk's silver tongue is really shown off to full extent, and I feel he'd get out of any situation, he does it in so many fun ways here. The Daleks fight with the Egyptians is fairly entertaining, especially as we can see it properly as it's a surviving episode. I love how Chen cowers behind a large stone when the Egyptians attack the Daleks, despite his bravado mere seconds before. Overall, it's a fun little episode, and it's starting to revive the story after a huge slump it had in the middle with episodes 7, 8 and 9. Ranking, 8 out of 10. Episode 11, The Abandoned Planet. This is a pretty decent episode, however it could have had a bit more substance to it, as it more or less boils down to give Hartnell a week's break episode. Most of it is spent watching Steven and Sarah explore an empty planet Kemble, as most of the Daleks are hidden underground. The scenes with Chen in it are great, especially when he thinks he's usurped the entire Galactic Council. His descent into madness increases the more his dreams of grandeur become fiction, which really suits his character. Overall, there's not too much to say here. It works, but there's not a whole lot to it. Ranking, 7 out of 10. Episode 12, The Destruction of Time. Yes, yes, yes! This is the most spectacular return to form I have ever seen. It's everything the first five episodes were. Dark, tense and brilliantly paced. Hartnell, after his little holiday, comes back shining with an amazing performance, as well as Chen having a great death scene where he even describes himself as the first ruler of the universe, revealing all the fantasies we've been playing through his mind the whole time we've been watching. When the time destructor starts, shit really goes down. Slowly but surely, everything around the Doctor and Sarah rots and decays. Stephen is safe in the TARDIS, but it unfortunately causes both of them to collapse mere meters from the TARDIS. The jungle of Kemble has turned into sand and rock, while Sarah slowly ages to death in front of the camera. They took enough pictures of it to almost entirely reconstruct the sequence, and it's really bloody chilling, especially when her skeleton disintegrates and blows away in the wind. With the Doctor only just surviving due to Stephen, the Time Destructor destroys everything on Kemble, including the Daleks. Both of them step out the TARDIS once it's finished, for one of the most powerful scenes in Doctor Who of all time, where they reminisce about everything they've lost for this hollow theric of victory. And it honestly puts me in one of the most solemn, melancholy moods I've ever been in. Well played, Mr. Spooner. Bloody well played. Ranking, 10 out of 10. Conclusion I love this story despite its numerous faults and slump in the middle, because when it's good, it's greatest of all time levels of good. Had this been condensed down to seven parts and only keeping in parts one to six in episode 12, it could have been my favourite story of all time. That's just how great it is. Definitely give this one a watch if you haven't. 
you will enjoy it, but do make sure to watch it in two or three sittings, as unlike the war games, it's not one you can just go through in one sitting. Overall score, 9 out of 10.